In our study today, we're going to tackle a difficult question, and that question and this broadcast will be focused upon what does the Bible say about alcohol and social drinking? Let's take a moment to pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, uh, we never open up the Bible without a genuine awareness of our need of You. You are the master of all truth, and the Holy Spirit was given to guide us into truth. I bow before You and I ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in these moments. I pray specifically for those who might be listening, who have wrestled with alcohol, people who are listening who even now are bound by alcoholism, people who may feel hopeless or feel like they'll never to be able to break the chains of addictions and sin in their life. I thank you that there is a supernatural power in Christ. And the scripture says if anybody comes to Christ, they become a brand new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. May today's time be life-changing for hundreds and thousands of people is our prayer. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. There is much debate uh, among Christians on both sides of this equation when it comes to alcohol and wine and beer and social drinking. And I'm sure that there are multitudes that will watch this uh, time of study and you'll either be on one side of that equation or the other. So let me tell you right up front, I'm not your enemy. Uh, if you're new to our broadcast, I do my absolute best to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible, and we'll do that today. Now, it's not going to be possible. I, I do realize that there are a multitude of questions and a multitude of passages. I mean, in this Bible that I'm holding in my hand, there are over 200 passages in the Bible that deal with alcohol and wine and drinking and so on. So there is much content in the Bible. This will not be the only study that I'll provide on the subject. This is the beginning subject that I will do on wine, alcohol, and social drinking. But as a Christian, and don't miss this, if you're a true Christian and a follower of Christ, you must be subservient to the teachings of the Bible. The Bible is God's written will for your life. And so every sincere and truly committed Christian, when it comes to matters of, matters of doctrine and faith and conduct, they have to be answered not just by the Bible, listen carefully, by the proper interpretation of the Bible, and never by our preconceived biases, by personal experiences, by secular standards, or even by misguided individuals who call themselves Christian ministers. So if you have a desire to learn and grow in knowledge and understanding throughout your life, you have to embrace two very important things and write it down in your notes. If, as a believer, you are committed to being a serious student of the Bible, and you are committed throughout your lifetime to being a growing, dedicated, committed student that you want to, it's your genuine heart's desire, I want to increase in wisdom, in knowledge, and understanding. If that's you, here's two non-negotiables. Number one, you must submit yourself to a small group of trusted, tenured teachers. There's a reason why, historically, all both sacred and secular institutions of education have a small, limited number of teachers. If you remember going to school, throughout your entire lifetime, through graduation from high school, you only had a handful of teachers that 
that taught you math. You only had a handful of teachers that taught you science, social studies, geography, and so on. One of the greatest mistakes I see in the modern church is because of the advent of social media, there are people who scroll and scan continuously down through Christian content and teachers and pastors and evangelists and prophets and so on. And the first thing that catches their eye, they take it all in and they're just continually listening to this nondescript list of people. That's not how you become a successful student and a serious student of the Bible. And that is not how you're going to grow in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Rule number one, you must submit yourself to a handful of trusted, tenured teachers. Uh, that should include your pastor. You should have a pastor that you trust and that has experience and is making every attempt to rightly divide the word of truth and has a history of abstaining from false doctrine and false teachings and so on. And the second rule is you must be willing to have a humble and teachable spirit. Don't be a know-it-all. Don't be an individual quick to give your point of view. Students should be ready to learn, ready to listen, and ready to receive. And that's what I'm going to ask of you today because I do realize that the subject of alcohol and social drinking is a very contentious issue in the modern church. With that said, we're going to answer three questions. If you're taking notes, question number one. Was the wine and alcohol in biblical times comparable to the wine and alcohol of today? Uh, that's question number one. Let me give it to you again, those who are writing it down. Was the wine and alcohol in biblical times comparable to the wine and alcohol of today? <clears throat> Any Christian or biblical discussion on the use of alcohol must understand that there was a significant difference between the alcohol and the wine and the drinks that were used in the Bible and the wine and the alcohol that we have in our modern society. Let me share with you just a few of the significant differences. And again, if you're taking notes, you can write them down. Major significances between the wine and alcohol of biblical times compared to the wine and alcohol of today. Significant reason number one, wine of the biblical era had a much lower alcohol content. Wine and alcohol in biblical and ancient times had a much lower alcohol content. Wines in biblical times are estimated to have been from uh, and there's variances, obviously. It's why the Bible talks about uh, various uh, levels of, of wine and alcohol in the Bible. Let me give you an example of that. In the Old Testament, there are 11 Hebrew words that we translate as wine and alcohol in a modern English Bible. That's right. In the Old Testament, there are 11 different Hebrew words that are just translated in a modern Bible as wine or alcohol or drink. And then in the New Testament, which is Greek, there are five words that are translated simply in our Bibles as wine. But in the original languages, both of Hebrew and Greek, there were levels of definition that we simply do not have in modern English Bibles. And so you understanding what I'm about to teach you is significant in the debate of alcohol and social drinking in the modern church. Wine in biblical times was commonly, as far as alcoholic content, 7 to 10 percent. Now here's another important thing of history that's very pertinent to this discussion. 
they lived in a culture of agriculture. Uh, they uh, didn't have grocery stores, they didn't have freezers, they didn't have refrigeration, they didn't have all of the modern appliances that we have. And so everything in this era of time, in biblical times, that was raised, including the fruit of the vine, they had to protect it and preserve it. And so because they didn't have distilleries and they didn't have modern appliances and they didn't have refrigeration, uh, once they began to store the grape juice from the fruit of the vine, with time the natural sugar content would begin to ferment. But the wine that they used most commonly uh, for family consumption at meals was 7 to 10 percent in alcoholic content. Now the other thing that you need to understand is that wine was not usually shared at a meal in that natural state. Uh, by contrast, modern breweries and distilleries produce table wines, fortified wines, hard liquors that are minimally around 14 percent, oftentimes 18 to 24 percent, uh, harder drinks 40 to 50 percent, and where I was born in West Virginia where they make their own moonshine and other parts of the world, uh, it's far beyond 40 to 50 percent uh, proof. Uh, number two, Ancient wine, as I already mentioned, commonly was somewhere around 7 plus percent in alcoholic content. But they didn't drink it straight. It was always, hear me, it was always diluted with water. Ancient wine was diluted before consumption. Write that down. The wine and the alcohol that you're reading of in the scripture was not like modern wine, not like modern alcohol, not like hard liquors that we have today. Wine that was used in family consumption, even in festivities, was about seven plus percent in alcoholic volume, and it was always diluted before consumption. The ancient records of both the Greeks and the Jews wrote of diluting wine to avoid intoxication. Drinking unmixed wine that was not diluted, forget the Christian culture, forget the, Christ, the, the, the Jewish culture, the secular Greeks in their ancient writings wrote about it being barbaric to drink wine that had not been diluted with water. Now, what was the dilution ratio. Uh, again, as you uh, delve into deep study on this, you're going to find that there are multiple references, but the common average was three to one. Three parts water, one part wine, that wine being around 7% or so in alcoholic content. When it was mixed three parts water, you can see that it would have been almost impossible to be inebriated or intoxicated by drinking uh, even several glasses of that with a meal. Uh, in Homer's Odyssey, uh, they diluted, it's referenced there, 8 to 1. In Pliny's Natural, 20 to 1. And so it varied as to how much it was diluted. But the common wine in biblical times after dilution Listen carefully. When you are reading about wine in the Bible, most often, now again, 11 Hebrew words, 5 Greek words, 16 different original language from original manuscript words that are typically only translated as wine or fresh wine or new wine or strong drink in the Bible. And so our modern English Bible does not really give us the depth of understanding as to what was being consumed in a casual reading of Scripture. But the common alcoholic content after being diluted in biblical times, uh, and scholars almost across the board that are reputable agree it was somewhere between 2 
and two and three quarters percent alcoholic. That's right. The common wine most referenced in the Bible was only two, after dilution, two to two and three quarters percent alcohol. Now, by our own modern standards, to be a legal alcoholic beverage, it has to be 3.2% or higher. And so that's why you have things like near beer and non-alcoholic wines, etc. As long as a uh, company producing beverages keeps the alcoholic content under 3.2%, they don't have to even legally call it alcohol. And so by modern standards, what they were drinking at the table was not even considered an alcoholic beverage. By today's legal standards, what they were drinking in the Bible was not even alcoholic in content by a modern standard. Number three, the distillation process for liquors had not even been invented, let alone developed. Uh, distillation that produces modern alcoholic beverages with an alcohol content of 40% and, and much higher was not even invented until the Middle Ages. And so hard liquor, as we understand hard liquor today, was totally unknown in biblical times. So strong drink in the Bible is not talking about something like uh, a Jack Daniels or uh, some type of whiskey or, or, or scotch. Or, uh, I grew up in a home where drinking was never tolerated, so pardon my vo vocabulary being limited. But you understand what I'm talking about. Hard liquor, as we have available to us today in common grocery stores, was not available in biblical times. Number four, we're talking about the significant differences between the wine and alcohol discussed in the Bible and comparing it to modern times. So when ministers or pastors or, or teachers open up the Bible and they're trying to make an argument for drinking alcohol in moderation, if they're not discussing the radical differences between the wine and the alcohol of biblical times compared to modern times, then you're missing a significant part of the application of their teaching because you're not comparing apples to apples. You're comparing two things that are worlds apart. Uh, fourthly, diluted wine was necessary in biblical times. Uh, it was not just a matter of pleasure or, or for festivals. Wine was necessary in their culture. Why? Because, again, of the primitive nature of, of flowing water, and sewage and the dispersing of sewage in villages and towns and communities, etc., water sources were always polluted. And so they had problems with uh, common bacteria and parasites, and, and uh, we don't have to deal with that. Even though our, our modern water that comes through our faucets and through our taps is maybe not the healthiest water on the face of the earth. It has been infused with various chemicals and chlorine and, and various fluoride. I mean, depending on the city where you're at, the water that comes through your tap has been uh, in an attempt to be made as safe as possible. And in most towns and communities and major cities in America, you can drink water out of the tap without having a health risk. Now that's not so when you go to many countries, and I'll not mention countries by name because I don't want to offend people, but many people from America and from North America who have gone on vacation, and not the third world countries, they've stayed at five star and four star hotels and they've made the mistake of drinking water out of the tap or they brought you a glass of water at the restaurant that wasn't bottled water or purified water, you found out very quickly that the same problems they had in biblical and ancient times still exist today. That was, listen carefully, this is incredibly important, don't miss it. That was the primary use of preserving the fruit of the vine. The slight fermentation process 
killed Giardia, Cryptosporium, parasites, bacteria, and helped to make their drinking water safe. Very simply stated, I'll state it again, don't miss it, because this is perhaps one of the most centralized points concerning the debate in the modern church when it comes to alcohol, wine, beer, and social drinking. The wine, the alcohol, the common drinks of ancient times, of biblical times, cannot be compared to the alcoholic beverages that we have in modern times. Again, wine commonly 7% alcohol content, but always diluted. Most commonly, 3 to 1, sometimes as high as 20 to 1. But common in the research that I've done through the years, most scholars come back to a figure around 3 to 1. Three parts water, one part wine. The wine mixed in the water primarily was medicinal. It was not used for social drinking. It was used to keep them healthy and to keep their kids from getting sick and people having serious stomach disorders. We read about its medicinal qualities in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the wounded traveler. There by the side of the road, his wounds were treated with oil and wine. The wine was used as an antiseptic. And so wine in the Bible was not the party wines and the pretty wines that we often have in modern culture. It was used primarily as a medicinal application. Alcoholic beverages today are an optional recreational beverage. Uh, what do you mean by that, Tiff? I am telling you that in the Bible days, having wine and alcohol to treat water as a part of their medicinal purposes, etc., it was necessary then. I am telling you that in modern society and in the modern church, alcoholic beverages are an optional beverage. You cannot, regardless of your position on either side of the debate of social drinking in the modern church, you cannot make a case that alcohol is a necessity. It simply is not. There are all kinds of beverages available to you that are healthy and much more healthy, far more healthy than any type of wine, beer, alcohol. It's not a necessity in the modern church. People that do it are doing it for recre recreational reasons. I'll come back to that. And unfortunately, the alcohols and the drinks and the wines that are available to us today are far more potent. And don't miss this, much more addictive. It is historically and hermeneutically misleading to suggest that people using wine in Bible times is a justifiable reason for Christians using wine, beer, and alcohol today. I'm going to say that again. After everything that I have taught you in the last several minutes, what is evidence that is undeniable is that the use of alcohol today and using the Bible to justify its use is a violation of hermeneutics and a violation of proper interpretation of Scripture. Let's move to question number two. Does the Bible promote the health benefits of using wine or using alcohol in moderation? Now again, I'm only going to answer three questions in our study today. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed to our channels and to our content, you're going to want to do that because there will be a series of messages in the days ahead on this subject to answer other questions that are very important, but for sake of time, I wanted to highlight these three. So with that said, number two, does the Bible promote the health benefits of alcohol? Well, there really is one major verse in the Bible. Almost everybody that I have had discussion with or have been involved in a Q&A where I've sat at a table and the audience has been allowed to participate in Q&A or people that have 
uh, attended my classes or have been in our Law Slam events, uh, almost without exception, they all go to one verse. And uh, let me just take the time to take you there. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And go down to verse 23. Uh, these are the words of the Apostle Paul written to his protege in the ministry whose name was Timothy. And Paul is giving him advice because it's apparent Timothy has uh, stomach problems and st stomach disorder. So listen to what Paul told him in 1 Timothy 5 and 23. Paul said, Timothy, reading the New Living Translation, don't drink only water. You ought to drink a little wine for the sake of your stomach because you are sick so often. You see, some of the Christians, even in the first century church, because of the sins that were associated with alcohol and the Bible in multiple passages condemning intoxi intoxication, drunkenness. You know, the Bible says that a drunkard cannot even enter into heaven. That's serious. A drunkard cannot inherit heaven. Revelation chapter 20, I believe it's down around verse 8 or so. But this passage quoted as Paul encouraging Timothy to drink wine, again, is a total violation of proper interpretation of Scripture and hermeneutical process. Paul is not encouraging Timothy to socially drink. The wine was prescribed by Paul as a medical potion and not for pleasure, not for social drinking, only for the medicinal reason of addressing Timothy's stomach disorder. Because some of the Christians were moving towards a, a more legalistic view on alcohol and wine even in the Bible days. Why? Because fermentation in the Bible represents sin. That's another study. I don't have time to unpack all of that for you today. But fermentation in the Bible is always taught as a parallel to sin. That's why the Bible says, Be ye not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Fermentation is always connected to sin, to carnality, and to things that are not of the Spirit. And so the early church understood that by not only their background in Judaism, but by the teachings of Christ, fermentation was considered sin, not only in drink, but even in bread. That's why in communion they had unleavened bread. No yeast, nothing that could ferment was allowed. That's why to this day in Passover, they're not allowed to have anything that's corrupted by fermentation. Fermentation in the Bible was always a type of sin and corruption, which is why God forbid drinking for kings, for priests, for leaders, etc. I'll come back to that as well. So some scholars think that Timothy had sat under some of the teaching of that and had made a decision, I'm not even going to use wine at all. And he was drinking only water, and because he was drinking only water that had not been cleansed by the wine that was diluted into the water that killed bacteria, parasites, cryptosporium, etc., he's having stomach problems. The very verse tells us that. Paul said, don't drink only water. So hermeneutically, we can make the case Timothy was so bent against alcohol. Maybe he had an alcoholic relative. Maybe he had an al alcoholic uh, member of his family or was exposed to something that, that caused him to have a, a predisposed bent against alcohol. But he was drinking only water. Paul said, don't drink only water, which meant he was drinking only water. He was not using wine at all. But Paul said, you need to drink a little wine. He's telling him, you need to go back to the traditions of putting wine into the water, three to one or whatever it would have been in Timothy's home, to make sure the water that you're drinking has been disinfected. Why? For your stomach's sake, because you're having stomach problems on a regular basis. So I don't know how in the world you can take that text in context, in the full narrative of Paul's teaching, 
and Christ's teaching and the Bible's teaching and, t and say, and many do, many that are advocates for social drinking will go to this passage and say, even Paul said that it's good for our health to have alcohol in moderation, but that simply is a perversion of the text. Now let me just for a moment jump from the Bible to secular science and secular medicine. The newest studies, I'm not talking about old studies, I'm talking about the absolute newest studies on alcohol reveal one fact repeatedly. And do you know what the new studies have revealed about alcohol? No level of alcohol consumption is safe for your health. If you've never heard that before, do your own study, do your own research, and you're going to find that every new, proven, respected medical study on alcohol, they all now have come to this conclusion, just like they did with cigarettes after years and years. They finally admitted that cigarette smoking will kill you. Cigarette smoking does cause cancer, etc. It's written right on the packages now by law. It took a while to get there. Uh, some of that, I'm sure, was corrupted reasons, political reasons, economic reasons. The same might be true for alcohol. But all I'm saying now, forget pastors, teachers. I'm not saying disrespect them. I'm saying just remove me from the equation. Remove a pastor, a teacher, a Bible scholar from the equation. What are unsaved secular scientists and medical professionals and their research proving? They all are stating the exact same thing. The new absolute truth on alcohol. No level of alcohol consumption is safe for our health. The World Health Organization has now published a statement. It said when it comes to alcohol consumption, there is no safe amount that does not affect your health. Another report states, quote, alcohol is a toxic, psychoactive, and dependence-producing substance and has been classified, listen to this, and has been classified as a group one carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. This is the highest risk group, which also includes asbestos, radiation, and tobacco. I continue the quote, alcohol causes at least seven types of cancer, including the most common cancer types, such as bowel cancer and female breast cancer. Ethanol, which is alcohol, causes cancer through biological mechanisms as the compound breaks down in the body, which means that any beverage containing alcohol, regardless of its price and quality, possesses the strong risk of developing cancer." End of quote. Half of all cancers are now being told to us to be caused by alcoholism? No. One study said this, direct quote, half of all alcohol attributable cancers are caused by light and moderate alcohol consumption. End of quote. So, as a believer or as an unbeliever, you cannot talk about the so-called safe level of alcohol use. You cannot, either from the Bible or from secular science and medicine, make a case that alcohol is good for your health or good for your stomach. That simply, from a biblical standpoint, is a perversion of proper biblical interpretation, and from a secular and medical viewpoint is just a lie. I repeat, the World Health Organization released a report that said no amount of alcohol is safe for consumption. One alcoholic drink a day reduces your brain size. I'm talking about one moderate drink by their studies. 
One drink a day with alcohol reduces your brain size. And some of you have friends and family that can't afford to lose a single inch. One drink a day reduces brain size. And this study, by the way, was done with 36,000 adults. It revealed that going from one drink a day to two drinks a day was associated with changes in the brain equivalent to aging two years. That's light drinking. That's Christians who say drinking in moderation is good for your health. No, it is not. And every medical report by trusted medical sources from Harvard to the WHO and on down the line, they all agree no amount of alcohol is good. The Bible, listen carefully, the Bible simply does not promote the use of alcohol either in moderation or in festivities. It only acknowledged it and endorsed it for medicinal purposes, not for recreational purposes. It was added to the water to kill bacteria and parasites and cryptosporium and giardia and so on. In another study, I will address Jesus turning water to wine in Cana because that's another argument that is often made that the Bible endorses social drinking. But if you'll read the passage carefully, and there's too much meat on the bone to include it in our study today as we're about to finish our study. But to say that Jesus turned that wine into an alcoholic wine that was drank at the end would have meant that he condoned drunkenness, which the Bible said no one can even get to heaven, which drunkards that is, Jesus would have condoned drunkenness if he had turned it into an alcoholic beverage that aided in drunkenness. And if you'll read the passage carefully, there is no comment made, interpreted from the original manuscripts, even in the modern English Bibles, not one comment made about the miracle of the wedding at Cana where Jesus turned water into wine about how potent it was or how strong it was. It was the flavor that was commented upon. Great question for another study. We will come back to that in days ahead. Lastly, question number three, does Christian liberty give me permission to use alcohol? Now, my experience has been that believers who hold passionately to what I would call the Christian liberty view sometimes fall into uh, grace covers it all. They end up living an undisciplined and loose lifestyle that oftentimes has a risk of spiritual consecration. That's why the Bible warns us not to be lukewarm, but to be hot or cold, or I'll spew you out of my mouth out of the book of Revelation. God wants believers who are totally committed, totally on fire, and totally submitted to the integrity and the truth taught in the holy pages of sacred scripture. And so on one side of the camp, you have these believers today who everything is about them and my liberty and my freedom and God's grace covers it all. And they almost, as Paul said, should I use grace as a license to sin? God forbid. So certainly Paul taught against that. But then on the other hand, there are believers who tend to limit the Christian liberty view. And these people can oftentimes fall into a legalistic lifestyle evidenced by being judgmental, harsh, critical of any and all believers who disagree with them. God doesn't want you to be either of those. He doesn't want you to be a Christian liberty believer who everything focuses upon my rights and what I can do, nor does he want you to be a Christian liberty person who limits the grace and the liberty of God, whereby you're legalistic and harsh and critical and mean spirit and you're always causing problems in your local church and you can't get along with the pastor and you jump from church to church throughout your whole Christian experience. You can't stay rooted anywhere because you have that attitude that you're not teachable. That's not good. 
The Bible says in Proverbs, make allowance for one another's faults. Nobody's perfect in the kingdom of God. I certainly am not, and uh, none of you listening are either. But Christian liberty has to be guided by these rules of wisdom. And if you're taking notes, this is solid gold. Don't miss it. Christian liberty, taught properly, hermeneutically explained, rightly dividing the word of truth, has to operate by these principles. Your Christian liberty has to follow these principles. Number one, every believer must live by the standards taught by the scriptures. That's a non-negotiable. Every believer must live by the standards and the convictions taught by the Bible. If it's forbidden in the scripture, it is forbidden for all believers. Now, why would I say that? Because when it comes to alcohol and wine and beer and social drinking, in the Christian community, there are some that say, well, you know, our convictions here in the West are different than the convictions in Europe. I heard a pastor say yesterday, when I go to Europe, I drink freely because it doesn't offend anybody there. And I have Christian liberty and I, I do my best to stay within the boundaries of modern. That, that was a, a major pastor. If I mentioned his name, he's a notable author, notable pastor, openly teaching that. That's not right. If it's forbidden in the scriptures, it's forbidden for all believers. There is not a set of standards for Christians in Europe and Christians in America and Christians in Australia and Christians in the UK and Christians in Africa and so on and so forth. If it is taught in the Bible and it is a standard in the Bible, if it is forbidden in the Bible, it is forbidden for all believers. Likewise, if it is allowed in the scriptures, it is allowed for all believers. If there is a question of conviction, it must not be determined by your personal Christian liberty alone. What do you mean by that? There are some areas in the Bible that are difficult to interpret. There are some areas in the Bible that make it very difficult to be dogmatic and to say it meant exactly this. Well, what happens when we come to a place where there might be disagreement in the body of Christ on a secondary doctrine or an issue uh, maybe even like we're discussing today? It can never be determined by your personal liberty convictions alone. That's what Paul said. That's why I emphasized it in the infancy of the teaching and kept telling you I'm going to come back to this. So I've come back to it. And here it is. Write it down. We must also include, when it comes to convictions that we are not certain about, or we have question marks about, or in our own spirit, there's a flashing yellow light. We just do not have peace, or we wonder. We must include the examination, how will this affect my Christian reputation and character? Not just is it right, not just is it permissible. How will this affect, as others see me, that's why Paul said you have to consider people around you, other believers, young believers, unbelievers. In matters that are gray or uncertain or you have a flashing yellow light on, it's not just your Christian liberty that gives you permission to march forward. You have to examine yourself and ask, how will this affect my Christian reputation and character? Number two, does this have the potential of becoming a stumbling block in my Christian life? Does this conduct, does this behavior, does this discussion, does it have the, the risk and the potential of becoming a stumbling block in my life? I'm going to give you in just a moment as I close reasons why I uh, have never drank and why I never will. But one thing I think that many people don't consider is if you drink on any level, I mean, even if it's only for, you know, Christmas or Easter or a wedding or a celebration, that's the only time in your life and you have, let's just say, one glass of wine. And again, I'm not judging anybody. I'm just teaching. If you consume alcohol on any level, you forfeit your right to teach your children and your grandchildren not to drink. Because kids don't do what you tell them.
They do what they see. They build their life by the example of their heroes. And sometimes that's dad and mom. But as a, if you're a Christian and you're listening to me, if you allow drinking on any level in your home, and again, no judgment, I'm just telling you what comes out of that decision, you have zero right to ever warn your kids against the dangers of alcohol. Because the moment they see you drinking, you have no right to tell them about the dangers of alcohol. And if you do, worse, you're now making yourself out to be hypocritical. For the sake of my children and for the sake of my grandchildren, I do not drink. Does my Christian liberty give me the ability to drink? That doesn't matter to me. Christian liberty is not about me. It's about my Christian character. It's about my conduct. It's about people who see me. And as a minister, I should set a higher bar for myself than even I teach to others. And so any believer who has alcohol use of any dimension in your home and in your life, you can never tell your children or your grandchildren not to drink. And let me tell you what happens with children that drink. Children don't drink socially. 80% of teenagers that drink binge drink on the weekend by their own admission. And I have all kinds of studies to back that up that I'll not take the time to give in this teaching. I think most of you know it's true. Young people, teenagers, college age students, they don't socially drink. 80 to 90% of them openly admit they drink to get drunk, they binge drink, they party on the weekends and party hard, as many of you did as well. Does this have the potential of becoming a stumbling block, not only to me, but does it have the potential of becoming a stumbling block to a weaker believer or to an unbeliever? I can't imagine as a minister standing before God in eternity's morning because the Bible says ministers receive double judgment. And because I was soft on alcohol, or because I, I made no decision on alcohol, or I condoned alcohol, or I said so little that people felt I can do it by my own Christian liberty in moderation, how many new believers have come to church that came from a background of alcohol abuse, alcoholism, alcoholic fathers, mothers, broken homes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they came into church and got saved, but they began to have fellowship with Christians who believe that social drinking was a Christian liberty. How many Christians will have lost their faith and lost their way, not led back into the bars by a group of thugs, but led back into the bars by Christians singing Amazing Grace on Sunday morning? I just, I just struggle with that if I'm honest with you. What is the ultimate goal as a Christian, according to the Bible? Your ultimate goal should be to glorify God, edify fellow believers, and have a good reputation before unbelievers. That's the biblical goal. John 3.30, He, Christ, He must increase, I must decrease. So any discussion about Christian liberty that increases your life, increases uh, your pleasure, increases your recreation recreational behaviors, etc. I don't see that as a valid biblical Christian debate. He must increase. We must decrease. One thing I know for an absolute fact as I close, nothing good ever comes out of alcohol. Nothing good ever comes out of alcohol. The wine and the alcohol in the Bible was not the wine and the alcohol that we have today. The distillation process of making hard liquors didn't even exist in ancient times. It is a modern, listen, it is a modern plague. You can't watch a single program on television where they're not drinking continuously. Almost every time they walk into a scene, can I pour you a drink? It is constantly 
being sown into the eyes and the minds and the spirits of our society. And listen, over 80% of people in prison committed their crimes under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Nothing good ever comes out of alcohol. Nothing. And so though I may possess a Christian liberty, I take that liberty and I lay it at the cross. I don't want that risk in my life. I don't want that risk in my home. I don't want that risk in my children. I don't want that risk in my grandchildren. I want to live a life that is pleasing not only to God, but can stand the investigation of my most hated critic. Listen carefully, don't miss this. It is an unnecessary beverage in modern society. You don't need it. Think of all of the money you'd save, and this is for another teaching. You can become a millionaire just by quitting drinking at an early age. The average college student spends over $300 a month on alcohol. Imagine a student that invested that money every month over the course of their life to retirement. That's just one decision that would make them a millionaire. I could give you a multitude of reasons, and actually there's a study coming up on this subject I'll return to. Well, we'll come back to this again. And again, forgive me for not answering all of the questions that have come in. I wanted to at least lay down the biblical foundation, and today I've done my best to answer the question, what does the Bible say about alcohol and social drinking? And for me, the evidence leads to one verdict abstinence. And I will tell you this as I close. If you're a faithful student of mine and if you follow me on a regular basis, if I'm ever wrong, I will always err on the side of holiness. I do my best to never err on the side of carnality. And I would rather err on the side of holiness than err on the side of sin. Do you know Christ? He ultimately is the one who sets us free from all sin, all carnality, all weakness, all frailty. And today you can receive him by faith. Will you pray with me? Would you like to know in your heart tonight when you go to bed that your sins are forgiven? And listen, you might be listening and you're battling alcohol or battling alcoholism or you've felt like you're headed back towards a, a temptation that once was an addiction in your life. Only Christ can get you free, set you free, and keep you free. Pray with me. Pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know that my past is forgotten. And I want to know that I have peace with God and that I'd be ready to meet you. And so today I repent of sin and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And with the blood that he shed on the cross, cleanse my mind, my body, my spirit, and make me holy in your eyes. Today I receive salvation as the gift of God and by your grace. Today I'm saved, for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Keep me true, and keep me ready for your soon coming, and let my life be more like Jesus, and less like myself, I pray. Amen. Come in to stay, come in to my heart, Lord Jesus.